Salutations, everyone, and welcome back to the Crisis in TNO. Well, that is Oil Crisis. I'm your host, Mr. Oil Crisis Hater. But we gotta talk about the 1952 walkout. Sometimes Maruta wondered if there had been any point in trying at all. It had become clear minutes after stepping into Tokyo Telecommunications boardroom for an emergency meeting that Morita was in control. He yelled himself hoarse, berating his colleagues for giving up on their one chance of remaining independent, only to be met with their impassive stares or averted eyes. Ibuka had been the only one to engage with him, with cold dismissal that had cut the deepest. Now, as Morita watched the Fujitsu salaryman march into Tokyo Telecommunications offices in a steady stream, he knew his time was up. He'd been given no work to do after the vote, and it was impossible to skip the office gossip that he was unreliable. The thought made Morita grit his teeth in a mixture of frustration and shame. He couldn't go back to Nagoya. Not like this, bearing debts in place of gifts. He had to go somewhere else, probably nowhere in Japan, if Fujitsu was black blacklisting him. No one would take him in, but the world was Japan's oyster now, and surely there'd be a place to start again with grit and hard work and a bit of luck. Maybe Guangdong? And he wouldn't leave empty-handed. Maruti knew exactly which drawer on Ibuka's desk housed the transistor radio blueprints. He even nicked the prototype himself from Ibuka's desk, where it had been left so carelessly on his way out, Maruti saw Ibuka, leaning against a pillar with a cigarette in hand. As her eyes met, Maruti felt the urge to shout if this was what Ibuka wanted. A final insult as he spirited away Ibuka's possessions in his briefcase. But what was the point? This was exactly what Ibuka had wanted, but a resurgence. Amidst the abject chaos and instability in the oil crisis, this dynamic duo that held Guangdong together was able to find a small moment, a piece to eat lunch together, and celebrate an important success. The latest reports from across both Li and Morita's corporate empires had just come in and they brought satisfying news. As the chicken karaage, uh, karaage uh, disappeared from both their bento boxes, the two looked at each other's reports and nodded approvingly. Rito turned around right quick in Koshu District, and a bit more slowly in the other districts as well, huh? Quite so, Kale. I noticed here that people have started buying Sony Electronics from my stores, and others too, more recently, going back uh, to the way they used to be uh, before the oil crisis started. That's wonderful. It also seems that your banks and whatnot are back in ship shape again too. It was back and forth, the two executives celebrated the success and returned to a new normal. Hard choices have proven necessary, and sacrifices had to be made, and sort of all that, that what those that could rest easy. For the time being, the corporate ships were safe and stable as anything from a Sasebol shipyard from Sony's electronics factory to Chung Kong Retail Financial Network. And it was good. It was very good. And we're doing okay. Poverty's still getting better. But our deficit, um, let's not talk about that. Growth, let's not talk about that either. <coughs> and excuse me. But we have a giant cup of coffee here uh, from Starbucks. So, right now we have, uh, we're pretty good on quality and interest. We're still trying to improve it with the next bout of political power. Um, so we're just kind of waiting. Unfortunately, though, for us, <coughs> excuse me, with the PTRG group, we need to carry out mountainous, mountainous combat operations, but we cannot because, well, the Italians actually capitulated the group that was over the Sudan group over that was over here. So all we have left is a Sudanese free officers organization. As you can see, they're not doing so well right now. But we're getting there as we tap additional reserves. And then if you want to about kept again, please go right ahead. So this will help us out a little bit. Followed up with uh, our streets, our borders. To the economists and financiers of our nation, there are only a few similarities between the Yasuda collapse of the 60s and the oil crisis of our current year. To everybody else, it may very well seem like the death of Guangdong itself. The fear is palpable, but we cannot succumb to it. Let us show our will and power to the world that Guangdong is strong and stable for the sake of our people and the Japanese and Chinese watching from abroad. Investors base. That's a stupid idea, K.L. Li Kishin shook his head as he stared directly at the chief executive Marita. His balding brow furrowed in distaste. The two were seated opposite each other in Marita's office. At Sony's Hong Kong headquarters. Bathed in the ceiling lights, harsh white glare to compensate for the clouded darkness outside. <clears throat> I haven't even gotten to know how this would be structured, Kishin, where he just said, having been momentarily stunned by Lee's unsparing assessment. Let me explain. What was there to explain? Lee threw his hands up, his palms framing his face in disbelief. You're going to raise Sony investor capital to pay for the government programs? Mixing private and public money? Not even Suzuki was this. We're trying to keep key social programs funded. Paying for the house inspector and teacher salaries, Marita shot back. You want some of these programs more than I did. Lee's mouth snapped closed as he leaned back into a seat, <clears throat> begrudgingly conceding the point before trying a new line of attack. Still, an open stock offering when some of our long-term retail investors are starting to cash out, your investor base is already shifting to kale. What happens when the speculators get too large to be ignored? And what's the alternative? I'm not ending up like Suzuki did, Marita argued back. Even after throwing my own skin into the game, the stakes get even higher. Oh boy. <coughs> That'd probably stress me out, even though I'm already stressed out as is, but something from nothing. Oh, well, look at this. Uh, a mild gust of wind blew in from the jar window, announcing its presence with a pop of bulb whistle. The dull, luminous light emanating from the dangling light bulb bathed the room in hues of unnatural white. Nakata uh, glanced towards his vague reflection within the surface of his pitch black coffee, his fatigue expression and darkened eyes still making themselves apparent. Before next week, before next week, how could any person complete this seemingly Sisyphean task in this infinitesimal small amount of time? He had been scurrying through document after document, slaving away in the future effort of finding funds within thoroughly dried out coffers. Perhaps Stanley Hall wanted him to magically conjure them like some omnipotent wizard? 
Nakata took a deep breath and continued to send a torrent of hot coffee down his throat like I do. The bitter taste lingered, but he was too exhausted to dwell upon it. Another beige envelope was open, and Akata's eyes once again went back to reviewing fruitless numbers, trying to keep himself awake by periodically sinking his fingernails into his skin. Despite the laborious, or laborious and seemingly pointless nature of this assignment, he knew that this matter was more important than it seemed. Guangdong's deep pockets were empty, waves upon waves of people needed to be paid, including himself. This proposal had to be submitted sooner or later, unless he decided to swear off eating for a month, which I kind of do sometimes. He wiped away a bead of sweat trickling down his cheek, thankfully. He knew all well that, that not all was lost. The administration was at least intelligent and perceptive enough to build reserves during times of prosperity and abundance. Hopefully, it would be possible to tap into some of those and mix them together with whatever he could squeeze out of the other sectors. There should hopefully be no issue in the case. However, was it enough? Leave no rock and turn. So because we chose a Guangdong feature fund in the Silicon Years, we get more miscellaneous income. But it increased miscellaneous costs, which is not good. Uh, GDP growth decreased by 0.2%, which is not very good. Ugh. So we'll do this one, the one. Reinforce the police presence. What do you pay the police for? And more importantly, we're willing to pay for overtime. Buckle down. Crisis management is first and foremost an exercise and prioritization. So we must manage affairs close to home. Call in a favor from Stanley Ho. He owes us for all the backroom dealings. Let's see what he can do for us. Which is the route we're not going to go because I don't want to increase the triad control. Um, the second Japanese way, which we can do... Must address the infl second influx of Japanese migrants from China seeking new pastures in Guangdong and the brain drain. Must address the outflow of Zhujin and Chinese labor to the Republic of China. Buckle down. Huh. Or reinforce the police presence. And our efforts to strengthen and professionalize Guangdong's security forces are bearing fruit now, especially when we need them to do the jobs more than ever to prove that the camp by tie are unnecessary. As Guangdong buckles under economic hardship and murmurs of social unrest, we'll ensure that the police have everything they need to maintain order and hunt down dissidents and troublemakers, no matter the cost it will entail. I mean, it is pretty darn good. But buckled down, and Suzuki's failure during the Yasuda crash was his inability to maintain a steady hand during the crisis, his failure and that of his administration to pull a facade of stability and calm not only panic investors but worry the public and embolden dissidents. We shall make no such mistakes. We'll not stand idly by, but we'll not give in to the temptations or panic or alarm. There's no need for dramatic action or public theater, theatrics, but merely guiding the light to steer Guangdong through these troubled waters, which I think which is best. We could do this if we need to. And I don't want to do this one, but I think Buckle Down would be our best bet. Does this determine what we're doing here? No. It doesn't look like it. So, I want to buckle down. We're going to buckle down and grid through. We don't need extra police reports or police security details. Because we're already almost leaders of this entire group here. Which is very good for us. That was a perfect no. But we're actually very good. So I'm actually feeling comfortable with that. We need 50% more product quality as well. How many more days left? We have 69. And we're selling to America because we need profitability. Even though it pisses off Japan more. That's alright with me. Well, that'll be good. 15%. Is there anything here for 15? Or 10 and 5? Well, you know what? We've got 10 here. Which would be good. 92. So we need 7.5% more interest. So. But we're doing okay. We only get 1.4 political power every day, which is not good, but an overbearing sentimentality. I don't care how much Murita says he's doing what he does for the good of the economy or his clients or whatever. Ibuka muttered in disgust as he reached for a second glass of whiskey, refilling wordlessly atop the mahogany countertop. He's wasting time and money. <clears throat> hey, look, we made it here. Can they actually win here? Yeah, they might be able to. Kamai sat completely upright on a stool, with perfect poise, even without anyone but Ibuka to see it. Uh, it's not for any of our benefits, surely. It's patronage, pa politics, pure and simple. Sentimentality, Ibuka hissed. The Morita has already had an overbearing attachment to things, even when you know he should do better. It's not a sin to be attached to your own creation. To be too detached is becoming indifferent to success, devoid of ambition. That's not how any business should be run, Kumai said, swirling his own glass of wine, but that's business. When you talk about a chief executive and the responsibilities to us all, what would pass in a boardroom was an innocuous venture becomes wants and waste. <clears throat> I knew you'd understand, he broke nodded vigorously, before setting his crystal class down with a solid clack. You can't please everybody, I learned that a long time ago, and Marita still hasn't figured it out. Then we'll take what we please, Kumai said, raising his glass, and while our cheer dear chief executive is distracted elsewhere, Hitachi and Fujitsu watch from the shadows. So, where are we at now? So, we need 7.5% or 15. 15 is quite a bit. Or we could do 10 and. Uh, we need 15 though. We need 10 and 5. 10 and then 5 right here. There we go. And the piece was done. Research group, group, group turns. Even this one, please grab it. Back to normal Guangdong. Because we did 4 out of 5 missions, we get one more seat, a little more liquid reserves. Improves China's and Japan's approval of us. Nice. More profits, more growth, and growth. Thank God, Jesus Christ. I need, we need the growth so badly. It's not funny. So we're actually really close with what we've got here. 92%. 2 point. Going down by 0.88%. Wow, that's insane. Yay. 
79%, not bad. 95% is very good. Japan. China loves us. Quarterly growth of police influence in each affected region goes up by a lot. It's fantastic. Exactly what we could use right now. Hey, okay, so we have positive growth. Thank God, deficit is god awful. Which, oh, we're back here. Oh boy, oh boy, we're back. Just in time for the end of the month, too. Good job, everybody. Expectation management. <coughs> Excuse me. With these, we have every expectation that Guangdong is positioned to weather the oil crisis. Will these words land among the tycoons with a thull, dull thud as each businessman reviewed the briefing materials at their own pace? The sun filtered in through the blinds, lowered so that the evening sun extended tendrils of light onto the sheets of paper, rustling gently in a rare moment of silence in the chief executive's office. Frankly, your efforts fall short of your own initial expectations, Ibuka's acerbic comments snapped the room back to attention. All these compromises, these trade-offs, it makes me wonder if your coddling ways are as useful as you say. People work harder when someone's looking out for them, Marita resisted the urge to roll his eyes. If you compared Sony's Fujitsu's end reports, you might see that. And here you are with a briefing talking about hard choices being made, he bookish shot back, and if there are hard choices yet to come, I don't want you taking me down for your vanity projects. If you're questioning my will or my competence, you could just say so, Marita replied testily, his hand nearly snapping his pen in half. Uh, be that as may, Chief Executive, Kamai interjected, a mocking formality in his voice, you face competing expectations that she's Chief Executive. As President of Sony, to mercy and to profit, I think it's wise to remember that saying, he who chases two rabbits chases neither. Noted, Marita said coolly, without bothering to look Kamai in, in Kamai's direction. Kamai simply smiled and said nothing else. So where are we at now? 95%, we need 5% more. Thank you very much. We're done with high product qualities. And now we're just kind of waiting for 7.5% more here. I don't want any more corruption, but that's cheap. 78.8%, that's not bad. That's really not bad, actually. I'm okay with that. Ugh, keep improving this, please. Gives us more stability when we do this two more war support if we get this better and better and better. Yeah. Oh, do we have anything else here? No. Product cycle's active, which is good. Um, crisis management, and first and foremost, an exercise in prioritization. I want to prioritize people here. We don't need the police to crack down on people it's too much. The brain drain. Guangdong said no problem fighting labor to fuel our economy. That is until now. One type of immigration for my northern neighbor. As workers move south to partake in the Silicon Dream, the trend has been reversing in recent years, slowly at first. The oil crisis badly battered our trade dependent economy and led many to Guangdong to move back to the burgeoning industries of the RGOC. This phenomenon poses a grave risk. To Guangdong's economic standing is once plentiful labor grows increasingly scarce, threatening the very bedrock of our economy. Let's find ways to address this brain drain before it's too late. Snapshots. Officer Wang leaned against ble some bleached walls of his police box, sitting at the edge of the rice fields surrounding Shan Shui Yang. It was a notable town only for the fact that everyone left, willing or not, for the distant mega cities and for Chinese border crossings a few miles away. These days, however, people were coming back, destitute, desperate, simply seeking greener pastures. Uh, they all wanted to walk northwards, towards the border, towards China, towards rumors of modernity in a forgotten homeland. He briefly wondered if he should join them, of course, too. Uh, 79%. I don't want any more corruption. This is cheap. We'll do it. We're done. <clears throat> Corporal Asano fought back a groan as Kenpate Lieutenant marched them back towards the docks, another ship of the Shanghai had disgorged a throng of Japanese businessmen and their families in Hong Kong. Asano wearily checked their documents, listing listening numbly to stories of dwindling opportunities in China proper before marching them to customs. Local customs officers were always amazed at how much was declared, invariably pocketing a small sum. The son bitterly noted it wouldn't be the last time Guangdong would enrich itself at its new arrival's expense. The companies let more slip through their fingers. A single voice rang out among the hushed warehouse assembly. Uh, bathed in red emergency lighting, we welcome our newest comrades, drawn to us by posters or from soup kitchens. A ripple of quiet applause. Thankfully, uh, the Federation tradesmen occupies the police attention. We have peace for now, but... Eventually, the Committee of Chinese Labor must return to action. For unity or for revolution of China? The Vice Titans. It's too late to walk around or to talk about avoiding layoffs. Our district just had 200 people made redundant. China surveyed the drawn, exhausted faces of the Guangdong Federation of Tradesmen Executive Council, and an inescapable gloom pushing them all deeper into their seats. They were working ceaselessly to keep the independent Zhujin afloat, but where was the chief executive? The pressure from Matsushi to Fujitsu Hitachi was relentless. Neither Sony nor Chung Kong, his own employer, seemed able to stop them. To say they were disappointed with being accurate, Chun thought they all felt foolish to have trusted Marita in the first place. Officer Hay Hayashi Yoshiko called out in Japanese, waving Lam over to her table in the crowded bar before switching to Cantonese. Can I get you anything? I hear you're on double shifts. Beer sounds nice, Lam grinned, hardly bothering with formality with her. Everyone stretched thin. Nobody wants a repeat of Yasuda. That's exactly what's happening, though, isn't it? Yoshiko handed Lam her beer. Her fingertips slightly blew from the chill. Jobs people crowding the alleys, protesters in the streets. It might be worse. Lam nearly drained his glass before turning towards Yoshiko. We see new Nugri, something about a Chinese community for change. A group we've never heard, and we keep seeing more and more of it. People aren't just desperate Yasukawa, they're angry, and ever since Najing stood up to Long Yun, they think they have a chance too. Ooh, the whole Long Yun thing really put a bad thing for people. Nice, at least we were there. So, reschedule. Can't wait, Li's wife, Yun Ming, 
uh, wringed her hands nervously as their son rubbed his eyes sleepily in the hallway. You hate being called from Hong Kong on weekends. He K.O. knows <sighs> Lee sighed, unable to fully mask his irritation. I'll be back tomorrow morning. Sorry. The sun had reached noon by the time Lee arrived in the Koshu government complex. Dabbing sweat from his brows, he marched towards Marita's secretary. Is a K.O.N. urgent meeting? Chief Executive is, in an, is on an inspection, the secretary replied. I can leave a message. That's fine, Lee grumbled, yanking open the door to Marita's office. I'll wait. The room's shadows had lengthened considerably before Lee hurried, heard hurried footsteps in the hall. What's the urgent, Marita wheezed as he entered. That you have to come to Koshu on a weekend off? You wanted a meeting, Lee stood, his voice rising. Your secretary called this morning. What? Marita said, stupefied. My secretary said you needed to... Two looked at each other in numb shock. Before Marita looked back into the hallway, hallway to call for a secretary in question, but she was gone. Marita turned back to Lee, a tar pit of apprehension bubbling above their stomachs. Get back, get, get back home, Kishing. Get back home now. Oof. We're gonna buckle down and save these people if we can. Brain drain, second Japanese wave. A shockwave from the Middle East reached Asian shores. Japanese companies across the sphere find themselves reeling from the twin blows of the oil crisis and the surging Chinese competition. A stock price has plunged for the second time this decade. Many conglomerates and companies are left looking for a safe harbor and space to rebuild their operations. Guangdong is this harbor. We are, by advertising ourselves as a port amidst a storm, we can attract viable talent and capital as companies flock to establish themselves on the Pearl River. Our Zuzhen backers, however, may any business owners themselves will be less than pleased should we take this Japanese wave yet again. Unceasing, not unchanging. Oh, wake up, listen to the radio, catch a crowd of street tram, morning meetings, pitch proposals, schedule interviews, jostle with the crowd at the local kongi shop, knowing Cantonese, made sure Yoshiko wasn't left with the overboiled scum at the bottom of the pot, pound the pavement, take notes, interview subjects, write, go home, write some more, sleep, repeat. The routine of Yasukawa Yoshiko, uh, day had hardly changed and she didn't know whether to be thankful or deeply worried. Thankful because she still had a job and a roof over her head. Her landlord grumbled she was one of the few tenants in her apartment building who hadn't requested a deferral of rent. A daily routine kept her focus, centered, even as everything else changed around her. That was the worrying part. Street urchins were quickly on their feet and quicker with their fingers because of the increased competition. She avoided eye contact with the older gangs in the alleyways. Every morning, she could see a growing legion of panhandlers slumped onto the sidewalk before a patrice patrol whisked them, whisked them away. What do you please do with them, officer? Yoshiko had posed a question to Lam one day. While passing by, a street of shutter shops and stolen men, with Lam now more an escort than an interpreter. Bring him in, Lam sighed, and let him go by midnight. Loitering is a nuisance, but it's not a crime. That's it, Yoshiko raised her eyebrows. Things are getting worse by the day, and all the government can do is sweep things under the rug. Lam shrugged. That's as satisfied as Yoshiko. Check it in. Marita knew, or knocked twice, before opening the door to the chief secretary's office with a hesitant creak. Lee made no motion of having heard any of it, even after Marita put down a pot of tea on the desk. He sat for several more moments, with only the sound of Lee's pen scratching against paper filling the office. He just went working for days straight, Kishing, Marita started. Just want to check in, you need some rest sometime. I find a kale, Lee muttered, muttered, muttered bitterly, while taking his eyes off the page, not much for me at home anyway. We're, we're working on that, Marita coughed, trying to change the subject, but working yourself until you collapse at your desk isn't going to help either. Not fair to take time off, is it? When the rest of the world out there works another night or for next to nothing, Lee finally looked up, a pain grimace on his face for a split second. Sorry, that was uncalled for. A break it would be nice. Even as he said those words, Lee's expression darkened, but if my family isn't with me, we'll talk about work then. Marita hung his head momentarily before raising his hand in surrender. But don't take, forget to take care of yourself, please, and we'll figure this out, I promise. Gone. When Lee Kishin came home to his Koshu residence and found it deadly quiet with the windows all open, he immediately broke out into a cold sweat. His security man felt it too. They formed a tight cordon around him and drew the guns as they moved into this house. Then, to the horror, they found the guards dead inside the main entrance, killed and quietly without a fuss. Just as concerning was the place it was trash, but where was... The Chung Kong man found a few people hiding in one of the pantries. None of them could answer. Kishing's most important question. Where was his wife and kids? As the tenth and last survivor answered the same befuddled panic, I don't know. The apprehension felt devolved into... He felt devolved into full-on panic. Kishin looked all over. He searched desperately through every single room in the mansion. The guard, just as weird as he, split up and tried to look through the rest of the mansion while their boss tripped over his feet, going from one room to the next, and they found nothing. At last, they're going into his and his wife's bedroom for the third time. They found the only possible hint of where they'd gone. I know the words, end austerity if you want to see your family ever again, you Hanjian traitor, scrawled on it. Murda Kyo, trying to relax at home, was distracted by his concern about the events of the day and his least family. Suddenly, a call came in before Kyo could even say hello. Kishing cried out in abject panic. They're gone. They're gone. Oh god, that's not good. Someone's messing and screwing with us, which is not ideal. People are going to have to pay for this. Still looking okay, second Japanese wave, brain drain, demand corporate accountability. Exchange for control on the flow of migrants across the border, the Republic of China is a man we take binding action against labor abuses. It would be almost impossible to sell to anyone outside of Sony Chung Kong to be adequately prepared. Allow open borders, except that it will be largely open border with China, even with the Chinese corporation updating some visa regulation, which is not bad. Not terrible for what we want here. Assert ourselves, insert ourselves into the vacuum. Japanese capitals fleeing China, or workers are running into China. It's an opportunity, not a curse. Welcome them in. Jap Japanese capitals always welcome Guangdong, especially if they, place it, if they place it at our disposal. Suzhou and Chinese descent more against the government will become more numerous. They knew the risks. 
Every businessman knows a maxim. Buyer beware, and it seemed the Japanese forgot. The more growth increased China's opinion. They knew the risks. There goes Iran. What's this one? No. Increase. How much does Japan like us? Uh, Seventy-nine percent is not that great. Demand corporate accountability. We could maybe do that one. I mean, we don't have enough votes. Forty-five by ourselves. If we get 100% from Sony Chung Kong, we would be okay. Hmm. Self uh, self evident that closing the border to one of our largest trade partners is out of the question. But we also make some kind of gesture that will make clear to the people of Guang Dong that they have more to gain from staying here rather than running for any open exit door they find. Only a grand decisive gesture will suffice to make this point. Fortunately, we have figured out the one to make. What we'll demand that the labor abuses that have plagued Guang Dong be immediately and publicly addressing the LECO. Though this runs a very great risk of costing us the LECO support, it will make a point for us that Guang Dong is indeed a better place to live. Intrusion, the Moria Toakeo and Masuchita Masaharu found themselves massively unimpressed by the people they were meeting. It was not unusual. Sometimes it was yet another crony of Hitachi. Sometimes it was one of the various jack booties in Lutko. Both Marita and Masuchita only really trusted a few of the delicates they controlled at any given time. But this case was unique. These are Japanese businessmen. Uh, <clears throat> delegates of the recent arrivals from Shanghai and Nanjing. These men were so self absorbed they could not notice the chief executive and the external secretary sitting. Are ascending side long glances at each other as they complained about worsening conditions in China and spoke of their hope to set up in Guangdong. Why the heck would I make my life harder by letting these parasites in? Morita muttered to Matsushita on his way to his next meeting with the Council General of the GOC, General Officer Commanding of the IJA Garrison. Matsushita nodded his agreement. Morita had put it quite well. A potential reason to do so emerged during that meeting. Within two minutes of sitting down, Takashima Masuo began to insist that Guangdong had to let him in. Chief Executive, we're making a firm, formal, urgent request for you to take in the Japanese businessmen being expelled by the transigents of the Nanji government. We need to preserve our economic investments in the continent. Nagano nodded along. Marita and Masashita both visibly balked. Takashima sighed, and Nagano successfully continued his contempt before going on the offensive. Chief Executive, you need to remember that this is nothing more or less than a matter of the security of the Empire of Japan and the, oh, of the co prosperity sphere. The sphere absolutely needs us to be involved in as many places as we can be. Morita and Masashita nodded, but showed no real enthusiasm for it. Because why would you? Doubling down on the police here. Oh, crap. Voting period will be 14 days instead of this many days. Hmm. So we maybe need to save up more political power instead of spending stuff with the police. Perhaps. Because will this piss off uh, Japan? No. Resurgent China, huh? Well, engineering is looking pretty good, even though we don't really we won't really need them. You know, it is what it is. We have no occupied territories. Oh, what's going on now? Is it Iran? Oh, a new Russian Republic. Look at that. Russian Federated Republic, the matter of drainage. I'll do respect, Chief Executive, but I really do sympathize with the people trying to run. Marita and Lee nodded. You've been expecting that response, as had Lee. It made sense, given that Marita just complained as an interlocutor. Uh, Chinese Consul General Guangdong Zong Jiguang about the issue of Chinese workers heading to the Republic, causing a labor and brain drain just as Guangdong needed them the most. Matsushita tried a counter-argument, ambassador, sure this is an issue of immigration law, visa issues, mutual obligations between Guangdong and the Republic of China, but Song shook his head. I'm afraid such concerns can't dilute my sentiments, Mr. Matsushita. I mean, even with everything you people have managed to pull off, people in Guangdong have been put up with a lot of horrible things. The workload is bad, their safety is often ignored the moment they look at their managers and they get beaten up. That whole mess with Hitachi, really the question is more how I couldn't sympathize. How couldn't I sympathize? The Consul General continued speaking. Uh, Guangdong wants China's cooperation in this matter, maybe we ought to do some house cleaning first. The other worst pieces are the ones that helped uh, set off this crisis, otherwise, even if we do tighten the border, they'll just keep coming. Alternatively, if Guangdong would open its border, and at this, Matsushita's jaw visibly clenched, we might be able to talk about visa restrictions and controlling law, the flow, even if that flow remains in our direction. Really not. Thank you, Consul General. I'll think, it, I'll think about it on the matter. Can we get this one done? The demand. The streets of Koshu were in chaos in the state. The city was, uh, control was hardly better off. A legislative council, according to the government propaganda, was a abode of sober, rational decision making. Guangdong was in a state of madness, too. The reason for the bad lemon, Lin Ko was standing behind the podium making a controversial declaration. Chief Executive Marita made his decision and knew for a fact that most would hate him. And therefore, it's my conclusion that the government of Guangdong, and therefore myself, we have no choice but to declare that the egregious labor abuses throughout the state will be investigated by the legislative council. To say that most of the delegates were unsympathetic would be an understatement of apostial proportions. Many of them were, in fact, on the edge of a heart attack brought about by sheer rage. 
Many faces, even from, some from Sony and Chung Kong, were red in abject rage. Up in arms were the prospect of being investigated for past conduct, these men shouted and slammed their fists on their desks where everyone could see them. Rich and Lee were very much on the back foot. They thought they, backed by a large swath of CK and Sony sympathizers, Cantonese and Japanese alike, tried more than there had been a decade ago, shouting in their defense, tried to argue that the proposal would not be retroactive and that there would be an adjustment period, most of the assembly remained apoplectic. Apoplectic. If you want to war with the corporations, you guy, one Fujitsu delicate shouted amidst approving cries from Fujitsu and Hitachi men, will give you effing war. Meanwhile, Guang Rang kept spiraling. The CF 2500 portable stereo. Home stereo systems have become commonplace, although their owners listen to the tapes and cassettes of their choice with clear, high quality sound, and comfort of their own homes. With only in their homes, with as the only available portable music players remain radios, which were the, the mercy of whatever was on the railways, or airways. That all changed with the release of the Sony's latest innovation. A CF 2500 portable stereo. It packs four speakers producing genuine stereo quality sound and cassette tape input into a package small enough to be easily carried by hand. Now you can take your music anywhere. Now those drunk kids will just turn them down. Look at that. That's pretty good. I have to increase Japan's pro because we marketed it to America, but that's alright. So I don't think we can bribe anybody, can we? The profit motive. Oh, look at that. Very nice. Uh, notes. Passing executive accountability ordinance, legislative dispositions, attached to pose, no point in attempting. Fujitsu, Fujitsu is the same thing. Lots well, of shooting deals separately, so out at a different time. So in each Hong Kong, a vast majority supportive. On a matter of as critical as this, which makes the refusal of the remainder all the more surprising. They've got a uh, temerity to demand payment in exchange for support, and the worst part is that retaliation is out of the question. Potential resolution. Leveraging the so-called envelope system to ensure total Sony and CK unity on the matter. Send the envelopes out. Great discipline in Sony Chung Kong to support the bill. There you go. So this increases China's opinion by 10%, decreases Japan's approval by 5%, increases GDP growth, decreases their seats by 6 increasing the Hitachi seat by 3 which really is not good for us. Ugh. They're really trying to hurt ourselves, aren't we? Actually, so we have how much corruption? 5%? Can you get rid of 5%? 2% right there. Alright. Well, we'll try this one. Corporate accountability. We have to try. Um, lots of shoes seemingly opposed, given the measure of demands accountability for the Japanese corporates, which they mostly are. But effort must be made no matter how much it costs, thus we lose yet more legitimacy among the sort of people of Mao Tse men can reach, unless of course we can confident our ability to prevail without them. Conclusion? That'll be done. Now we're good. Make a progress. Once again, Marita Kale was meeting with the executive of Sony's American branch, except this time, the two men sat face to face. The executive had flown all the way from San Francisco to personally inform Mao Marita on the Sony's progress in the American market, a matter of personal interest to Marita since he learned about the hostile reaction to Sony's arrival. Things have actually improved significantly since our last meeting. Um, the executive told Marita, the Nationals' demonstrations have decreased in frequency and severity, while electronic sales have continued to rise. If I were to guess, consumers are waking up to the quality of our products. They're buying our TVs, listening to our music on our radios, slowly but surely making us part of their daily lives, with less and less reason to join anti-Sony rallies. For the average American, convenience trumps anger. It's good to hear that they come to their senses. Marita said, and hopefully it'll be easier to expand to the other parts of America. Look at that growth, holy crap. And just it's okay, finally, thank God. Oh. As the executive left, Marita felt a swell of pride in his company and in his products. If this was the power of Sony quality, then it wouldn't be long until all of America watched TV on Marita's televisions. The supremacy of quality. Or by any other means. Her name. At that, um, Marita simply tore out the paper and calmly threw it in the recycling bin. There's no need to write, no need for written reflection on the matter. He could simply rely on his own memories, especially when it had only been some time ago. Uh, staring across the legislative council in his mind's eye. Oh, my bad. If you want to read that, please go, go back a tiny bit. But honestly, it didn't even matter. Because they are just talking about whether we can pass this or not. What really matters, my bad, is this one because there's so many short days. Oh, wait, what? 42, 48 days. Demand corporate accountability. Matt. The motion is passed. Okay, so there we go. The floor of the Legislative Council shook. It seemed under the pressure of the motion that exploded out as the Speaker uttered those words. Mass anger was a major majority emotion, followed closely by dissatisfaction. Swear words flowed back and forth like so many pyroclastic flows. Even many of those who had voted in favor were now expressing concern or confusion or regret or outright questioning their decision. Worse yet, a few Sony and Chung Kong men left behind envelopes that were very clearly letters of resignation. Now, sparing a single glance at the dyes where Morita and Lee sat, they left invisible disgust and never returned again. Yet the chief executive and his closest partner left wordlessly. At the end of their office, a telegram from the Chinese consul came and congratulating them for making the right decision. So we're at 95%. Oh. Cold comfort, Morita muttered. So now we're 71%. We're at a maxed up 100%. Holy crap. That's insane. So with that going on the entire time, like, every month, this should be making the police rise in quite a, quite a large amount. Because I know we're going to take a massive hit to police presence. 
um, everywhere eventually. So, secure. The protests that, we've recent, uh, that have recently bedeviled the streets of our cities of our contain. Guangdong's various official and unofficial authorities knew know what they need to do if and when things get out of hand. The twin crises on our borders caused by the effects of the oil crisis on the Japanese sphere have at last been addressed and contained. And for the most part, we know now what to do, but our plans may effectively be, be affected by the way in which the Chinese and Japanese react. For now, however, Guangdong at last knows the semblance of peace. All we need to do now is hold the line, watch the situation, wait for the economic cycle to begin training upwards again, as it always does. We abandon down the last hatches. All now that remains is to run up the storm. And nothing bad will happen, right? Right? An offer. A secretary knocked at Li Keqing's door as he struggled to work through some sock papers, which of course was nothing easy given that his mind kept wandering to his family situation. Another 15 seconds of erroneously calculating the sum of 75 and 27 was 92. He gave up and shouted, Who is it? It's it's a president of Fujitsu Limited to see you, sir. What on earth sent him in? The secretary opened the door, and in came Ibuka Masaru. With that, appeared to be a looking of look of genuine concern and a Fujitsu monogrammed dossier. Hope you're all right, Kishin. Not very, but thank you for asking. What have you come here for? At that, Ibuka sat down and made his offer. We at Fujitsu would like to help you with your family's abduction. Phone, tabs, surveillance technology, my own records. That's actually what this dossier contains. I'll help reach a better solution. Leo was obviously suspicious, and what would you personally get out of this then? Ibuka knew that the question was coming and tried it carefully, speaking completely from the heart. Nothing other than the pleasure that comes to sticking to a basic principle here in Guangdong that attacking the family of a tycoon should not be considered or tolerated. At that, Lee thought a little, then replied, yes, Thank you, Master, that would be great, wonderful, thank you again. Ibuka saw will come at a prize, but will aid our investigation. It's greatly aid the investigation to a family kidnapping. Thank you kindly, Master, but we'll be fine without it. Chung Kong seats, huh? And most of you have 40. Um, I don't want to lose this family, so let's go down this route and see if we can actually get things done and accomplished. Because um, if we can't, then we're kind of screwed. His family's kind of screwed. Which is not good, but still. Um, I want to save political power. 2% is not bad, but I don't want to decrease that either. 3.5%? What does corruption do? Not, not much. We just let it ride for now. 4.5%. That's 40, though. I don't want to lower any more... Support so we'll do this one. It's only 30. So keep a tiny tiny bit. So should be okay. Only 99% stability. We're very unstable now. Secondary schooling. Tertiary schooling would be good. Uh growth multiplier would be very good to get to. As we become more secure, so we get even better. So help our GDP growth malice and our GDP growth malice too. And the writing on the wall is next. Don't talk to me about that graffiti. Lamb grown on his desk with Yoshiko sitting opposite him. No pet in him. I like to think about something other than Committee of Chinese Labor. Too bad. It's all anyone in the Japanese social clubs can talk about except you, and I can actually understand it all. Yoshiko said, undeterred by Lamb's fatigue protests, it's Chinese solidarity and resistance awaken for dignity and for freedom. I know the slogans. Lamb's frustrations erupted towards the ceiling. Spring, Yoshiko. There's more every week in every district, and we can only capture street punks painting the darn things on the walls. Too sad silently. The air conditioning is uh, whirling in the window beside him. The police station had been expanding since they met years ago with all the resources that the government had poured into the police. It's like they had in almost every other part of life in Guangdong, from the suicide hotlines in the cities to the new industrial communities in the countryside. People aren't going to wait for more promises from the chief executive Lam's side, not for after the second economic crisis. Uh, Yoshiko. <clears throat> Look at her feet una unable to deny Lam's statement. The chief executives earned a lot of goodwill from the last few years. Sure, and you and me and a whole lot of other people, but for the man who just lost his job again? Um, asked bitterly, they feel betrayed, and after Chan stood up to Long Yun, they're, ba they're clinging to the hope that China can save them, even when they barely understand Po Tong Hua. So be careful, desperate people are dangerous people. Yeah, that's true. They're very true. Looking pretty good. Almost 100%, 100%, 63%, which is lower than what it has normally is, but you know, whatever. Almost October. Wow. The yeah, Iran looks like a giant mess, the GFT's woes. A plenary meeting of the senior membership of the Guangdong Federation of Tradesmen had just ended, and Li Chun took a swig up from a cheap bottle of beer as he slumped in his chair. By the heavens, how exhausting these meetings were, and that was on a good day, which this hadn't been, no. This an explosion in GFT membership had acquired a marathon meeting, the stack of minute papers were several inches thick. By and large, most of the recent editions of the GFT, a small man named businessmen or representatives of the so-called workers' concerns read underground unions, were from, from Fujitsu and Dachi, and a far less extent from Matsushita. These three companies, but especially Ibuka and Kumai's outfits, were far less receptive to the chief executive of Marichi's overtures, and therefore not most willing to wield the hiring X. The effects of this attitude <clears throat> were many and negative, and the GFT was forced to bear the burden. Um, 
With wealthier and Sony slash CK line members of the Federation were being stretched thin trying to provide whatever support they could, and the amounts they could provide per individual were declining. As the rate of membership growth far outstripped their resources, worse yet, allowing the government to do something about Hitachi and Fujitsu conduct wasn't just working. Something had to be done, surely. Fujitsu, and especially Hitachi, had to be taken in hand, if not right out, outright broken. But we're at a loss, Chun thought. How the heck are we just going to do that without getting us all arrested? Staring outside, uh, Chun saw a slogan new to be used by the secretive committees of Chinese labor painted on the wall. That's another issue. These CCL people, whatever the game is, are getting stronger. Lee Chun sighed. What in the heck are we supposed to do about all this then? That's a good question. What are we supposed to do about this? Hey, look, more growth, better deficit. Good. Downsizing. Yet another day passed in the Ludco. Today, same as yesterday, and what everyone expected to be perfectly emulated in the days to come. The factions screamed at each other to deliver to no avail, like most political arenas. The chief executive would announce some sort of new measure or another, which, if it was lucky, might form some insignificant benefit or another, but not immediately backfire or get shouted down by the rest of the council every day, circling a little bit closer to the drain but never quite reaching it. When Kamai once again took the stand, the delegates expected more of the same, perhaps some new proposal for the state investment into organ harvesting or illegally reclassifying the Chinese as livestock, but by this point, soon in Chung Kong delegates had stopped even attempting to stifle the ground. If Kamai was in any way perturbed by this as they walked to the podium, he didn't show it. Honored delegates began. The ongoing crisis and the continued failures of the state to combat the economic downturn have been a, continued, a continued disappointment to both myself and my colleagues at Hitachi. As long past time to confront and act upon truths that my fellow delegates fi may find unpleasant, as such, I must announce that Hitachi will be closing one third of its Guangdong based premises and relocating to more economically robust territories. This caused an uproar in the chamber over the shouting one delegate's voice cut through. Are you insane? The country's already going tits up and you want to kick us down even further the road? Come on, smirked. My first priority is the continuing prosperity of Hitachi Corporation first, and your country second. Our rivals, it seems, have wedded themselves far too strongly to this land with a contingency. A tragedy for you all, I'm certain, but Hitachi's lucky to have fur friends further afield. Throw into the dogs, and this is going to start a downward spiral. Relentless. Marina's waiting outside Sony, uh, uh, outside as Stanley Ho exited uh, Lee's office, closing the doors gently as he could. Under the cold gaze of the fluorescent corridor lighting, Marina raised his eyebrows in a wordless question. Stanley shook his head somberly as the usual answer. Kashin can't go on for much longer like this, Marita thumped his uh, fist against the wall in forlorn frustration. He doesn't leave the office, he barely eats. I don't know how much he sleeps, but the bags under his eyes have grown worse every day. I know Stanley's voice was quietly leaning against the wall, lighting a cigarette, and there's a precious little out of the investigation to update him about either. The two stood quietly in the hallway, their suits uh, wrinkled from days of repeated use as the two alternated between watching over Lee. Both men stared pensively at the floor and tiles in front of their feet, bereft of the energy of the will to do anything else. A clock mounted on the wall outside of Lee's office, ticked remorselessly onwards, its hands pointed straight upwards, midnight. Another day had come with a chance of Lee's family surviving their ordeal dwindling with every passing hour. We have to move faster, with unsolicited. Do what you must. Well, at least uh, Pirates getting better, right? Enough of this. Yeah, let's get in there. The news had gone, uh, not gone over well. The assembled workers of the Hitachi Steel owned uh, plant uh, had spent the first minute or so in shock and out. Then came the anger. Um, and then the remaining stages of grief were not forthcoming. The sirens on loudspeakers from outside the barricaded doors perhaps hoped to signal the path towards bargaining, although so far only threats have been made. Thang watched hostages blubber as she and six other workers stared down upon them, the brandishing work tools and looted security batons as weapons. Looking at them, she felt a sense of disgust that bordered on nausea. She wondered if this was how they had felt looming over them, dominating them, giving out the crumbs that had let them continue the fragments of their miserable lives, only to take it away when it suited them. Not pleasant was it now, no more. The Japanese wouldn't take away their jobs or dignity this time, not one more shred, not one step back. One of Fang's least favorite managers, now hostage, asked through quivering lips and broken Cantonese, Why are you doing this? This we did not do. No choice. Fang delivered a quick end of the man's groin. Do you want your teeth to stay in the same shape? Sh shut up, she yelled over his pained shrieks. No choice, my uh, butt, thought Fang. No choice but to cross over from Japan. No choice but to break her bodies on the altar of industry in their own careers. No choice but to do what they like with the Chinese women, with no possibility of any repercussions. You may not have signed the papers, but you chose all this, thought Fang. Time to reap what you sow. Which is why we need as much political power as possible, because things are going about to go kaboom! And not in a good way. Cross the session. Regular come on, this is getting ridiculous, said Matsushita. How many hours has it been now? If something happens to those hostages, it just won't affect our bottom line. Your bottom line. Our most dedicated people are going to start packing their bags home, and then who will be left with? Uh, not to mention how Tokyo will react. It is imperative that you begin with negotiations, Kamai, and fast. I must concur, said Morita, who was clearly doing his best to maintain an even tone, even though he had his look of utter contempt. I have no idea what you expected from your little downsizing project beyond making the Chinese desperate. I understand human dignity means little to Hitachi, but concessions must be made and now before the spreads. I'll be honest, Sadie Buka, I don't care for the welfare of the imbecilic brutes you call managers, nor for the common criminals in your employ, or formerly in your employ, but I am forced to agree with the others here. You screwed up. Since you failed to deal with it yourself and promptly, we have no choice but to negotiate. Before this reaches the Lego, before this reaches Tokyo, before anyone else gets any, any funny ideas, understand? 
Come on. Had uh, <clears throat> at the last several minutes of private meetings in a son scout that had been growing steadily larger. As the creases in his forehead threatened to pierce into the skull he spoke, I would have expected such weakness from you of all people, Ibuka. Going soft in your old age, but enough of this. I was frankly insulted enough being dragged into this meeting. This disturbance is a Hitachi internal affair, and will be dealt with internally by Hitachi. I do not have the time or inclination to look after your agenda, nor for your careers. Good evening, gentlemen. He turned to the left. The remaining CEOs looked around the room for a moment. Oh, well, that's not good. Crap. Not good for anybody, but a breath. Captain Haruo could do a little bit of stare at the carnage was about to unfold. He could see those men growing restless in front of him, and felt his own trigger to finger becoming steadily itchier too. After all, nobody knew who the hostages were yet, and he had a cousin that worked for Tachi, but orders were orders. They were to hold the perimeter from the cage, form the cage, for the line. As the police uh, idled around the factory walls, a growing number of Hitachi trucks and men drew closer to the gates. Kitted more and more as if they were fighting Manchurian partisans and a bunch of rowdy factory workers. Officially, the negotiations were going on. The Hitachi men would scream into their microphones for that the hostages were to be released and they would be surrender immediately. Um, this would in invariably result in shouts of go to hell, you Manchu bastards, or something else of that effect. As this went on, other Hitachi men lined outside the entrance, so machine guns in hand. One final warning was given, it was rebuffed as all others were. This was going to get very bloody. One of the hostages were killed, not by the workers, by Hitachi bullets. Uh, the police had already offered their supply of tear gas, and less than lethal rounds, but the private security men had just left. They are probably in for the slaughter. As the doors fell down, the automatic rattle commenced. Haruo made a decision. They could just hold the uh, perimeter. They couldn't just hold the perimeter. If the hostages were to make it out alive, men prepare to follow. So this is how it ends, huh? Hope we can find uh, Lee Kishin's wife, but unsolicited. Lee paid no attention to the sun sinking behind Guangdong's urban landscape with the dusk's rusted red glare giving way to an inky black did blackness dotted by flickering windows. As Royal knocks in a little further past his desk, even when darkness encroached, a solitary lamp provided light, ba bathing his papers and pens with an artificial warmth. He clung to that warmth as sadly as he gripped his pen, eking out a meaning to its existence with every scratch and scribble. Rudy had nearly begged him to rest, but most like, like most unsolicited advice, he threw it aside. No matter how irregular and unnatural his heartbeat became, throbbing from exhaustion and from stress, it was nothing compared to what his family was enduring at every waking moment. The shrill ring of the police, uh, the phone broke Lee's concentration, forcing him to acknowledge the hour, just past 11, far too late for anyone decent to be calling, but even as he tried to ignore it, the phone continued to ring, a, cacoph a cacophonous trilling that echoed into itself, a ceaseless wall reverberating in the darkness. Well, at least now, picking up the receiver simply to drop, stop the noise, what do you want? Our demands, a voice at the other end of the line was blunt, will they be met? Lee said nothing, he couldn't, wouldn't capitulate to criminals, even as he fought it down a rising tide of bile, knowing what they could do. The police flail in the dark, as inept as ever, the voice said, a mocking little to their tone. It seems that they, we, we were wrong to be afraid of you, Lee Kishing. They said anything you touch would turn to gold, but everything you touch would turn to dust. Lee flung the telephone set across the room as the line went dead. So this is how it ends. The shop floor had quickly become a gris grisly assemblage of machine and viscera. After the shooting had started, there was little further need for the hostages, say they were not going to get out alive, thought Fang, she would be darned if Hitachi managed to salvage or anything. Neither their men nor the machines would break anyone's bodies or spirit ever again. Fang's hated ex-manager head was stuck inside a lathe, hollowed up like a pumpkin. Another body lay folded in the recess at the end of a conveyor belt, spilling gray matter into the circuitry. Try cleaning that up, you guys. Of course, they were got only bodies on the floor. The Hitachi men had guns, and the workers did not. Some fought, others ran, others stayed put, staring with defiance and side contempt. But the outcomes were all the same. Then he managed to blindside one of them with a crowbar, downing him, but he quickly had been rewarded with a bullet to her side for her troubles. As a pain shot through her, and she fell to the floor, she had the good sense to dive into an adjoining room and then play dead. Luckily, it wouldn't matter. She had no idea if it, if it hit anything vital, and even if it hadn't, she expected to get shot again soon. Well, she thought, couldn't quite call it a good lie, but at least I had my pride at the end of it. She waited for the end to come. Only it wasn't coming. The Dutch men were not moving forward, instead they were arguing with some unknown force outside. Fang could understand the muffled Japanese, and so rushed a peek through the door. The police had entered the factory for some reason, and now he, they and the Tachi forces looked ready to punch one another. She moved slowly, painfully towards the window opposite the door. The perimeter wasn't there anymore. Maybe this wasn't the end. As she prepared to climb through, the, through she thought of all those who had fallen. Her friend Lin, riddled with bullets, Miao and Yan, sat against the wall, holding hands above a pool of blood. All gone, but Fang wasn't. Not yet. Your deaths will not be in vain, and they shall not pass, as I continue drinking. Because all I do is drink. Citizens of Hungli, a residential facility, blared the loudspeaker, you are interfering in a police action. If we continue to deny law enforcement entry to the premises, you will all be held collectively responsible for the harboring and known fugitive. Beyond the row of police shields stood Hitachi security, brandishing their guns menacingly but not firing them. This was met once again with a volley of shots and rocks towards the GPF lines. Some out the windows, others by those behind the line blocking the gate, arms were linked, faces morphed into perfect images of hate. Suspect Xiu and Fang is connected to the murders of 24 unarmed hostages and the loudspeaker was cut out by an enormous cheer. 24 more, 24 more came the call, and how many Chinese had to die for their money? Go back across the sea and take your laptops with you. 
As you find a warning before. Or what, you Manchu dogs? We beat you 60 years ago, and we're happy to beat you again now. A steel trash can fell from a top of uh, fell from a top floor apartment, sending two of the front officers to the ground, breaking the shield line. Then the mob at the gates charged. The Hitachi fire team lifted their guns, but were unable to make a clear shot between the ranks of police and protesters. Batons collided against bricks, fists, and broken bottles swung haphazardly without any care for personal safety. The GPS attempted to steal itself and break through, but with every passing moment, more and more Chinese ran out of the building to join the melee. Eventually, bruised and bloody, the police commander shouted, sounded a retreat, you can't take all of us, and calling all cars now. So, 100%. Things about to really explode here. Yay. All units be advised, disturbances have been reported in your vicinity. Exercise extreme caution. Dispatch requesting immediate backup along Taiyuan Avenue. Patrol vehicles are being blocked and chased by <clears throat> rocks, medical... Please hold officer. Our lines are experiencing heavy load and system malfunctions. Your request may take time to process. Demonstrations have spread to Hong Kong. I repeat, demonstrations have spread to Hong Kong. That's a negative. We cannot spare any cars at the present, and you need to handle this with what you have. All remaining units in the area are advised to pull out. I repeat, pull out and regroup at Central Precinct. All non-priority areas will be requests for military support has been denied. Tensions are along the border. Hold, can, can you wait for the situation to, de to de-escalate? Can't hold much longer. And the Inferno. Well, we'll start with this in this episode. Getting ahead. With all due respect, Chief Secretary, our men are following up on every lead as quickly as we can. Commissioner Amore said testily before uh, the cork board in the Lee's office. Uh, there is a limit to how much new, reliable information can be gained on a daily basis. Not good enough, Com Commissioner Lee snapped a ferocious anger in his voice. The kidnappers are running rings around your men, threatening me in my office, and all we can do is wait? Murray and Stanley Hill gripped their arms of the chairs uneasily, unused to watching Lee commandeered by his own emotions. Lee's report that had been threatened over the phone. Lee, uh, in his own office, no less, had put everyone on edge and seemed to have pushed Lee right off of it. The commissioner and Stanley found one lead, Marita said, quickly trying to stabilize the situation. A transport company based in Hong Kong, a front company based on the lack of any meaningful business they do. And that's as far as we've gotten, Murray warned. Front businesses are nothing special in Guangdong, and if we don't identify what exactly they're working with, we risk losing. Losing no more than what we already have, Lee interjected, slamming a palm on the desk. We've always been one step behind. This has to change now. Lee's vehemence ran ahead of them all. The Inferno. Here we go. And Koshu, the crowd's been assembled before the dawn. Their barrage of slogans and chants emanating up from the streets and alleys in front of the government complex. It seemed that the entire city had turned out in their anger. A teeming mass of men and women crammed shoulder to shoulder against a thin line of police at the gates. Chief Executive and aide hurried into the office without knocking. You have to stay away from the windows. It's not safe. Nowhere safe, Chief Executive Marita Kiao snapped bitterly. The mobs that had risen across Guangdong were well and truly out of control, turning the headache of the Hitachi factory hostage crisis into a raging inferno threatening to swallow Guangdong whole. The previous night, Marita Kiao and the rest of the tycoons had listened in horror as the police frantically reported being pushed back to key facilities in the Japanese districts in the larger cities, or breaking into full retreats on the countryside. The Zhu Jin businessmen and the Legislative Council were ducking his calls, saying little beyond the government's latest promises you weren't enough. All the while, the Japanese investors turned their eyes on the Chief Executive, equally angry at and secretly enjoying his plight. Safely barricaded behind police cordons outside their walled settlements. Sorry, Marita Kiao replied the after, shaking the cobwebs from his mind while throwing on a well creased jacket, and called everyone to a meeting. We needed a new response. All the while, Guangdong burned. The simmering anger and desperation of all people, once ignited, is nearly impossible to put out. The Guangdong riots have begun. I wonder in the future, when uh, Tino gets more content, where the Guangdong riots will help make China rebel against Japan, but that's a long time away. The regions of Guangdong have been updated. The amount of government control is determined by the amount of police control, supported by our ally in the Triad Tower. The riders still automatically seize three controls of three rural regions. Japanese frustration is based on the amount of Japanese approval we have. Perceived extremism of the Japanese expats has led to the rise of Japanese frustration. Due to the Guangdong riots, perceived instability, the Chinese and Japanese consulates cannot hold meetings with us unless the topic is directly affiliated with the riots. Oil crisis continues to destabilize the global economy, uh, claiming its latest victim the stability of the corporatic sta state of Guangdong in southern China. In the aftermath of massive economic turmoil brought on parties with global dissent and the chaos, the anger that has long built up in its ethnically segregated society, has finally exploded into violent anti-Japanese, anti-corporation protests. Martial law has been declared, and so far has not prevented a total, near total breakdown of order in many cities. The chief executive has released a communique indicating his intent to maintain order. It's not clear how successful, if at all, he'll be. Ugh. The pros of blaze. It touches the debacle during the factory strike crisis exploded into a nationwide catastrophe. Guangdong stands united in protests, and not a single city street has remained silent since that dreadful day. Their voices chant for reparations, and a delivery on promises made by Chief Executive Morito Akeo. Okay, uh, the people screaming in our ears weren't bad enough, the structures of the government themselves are being bent and twisted. Corporations are willing to see the profit margins decreased by even minuscule amounts, are pressuring us to let these protests die out naturally without seeing an inch to the people. With the two interest groups, Morita tried so darn hard to placate each other's throats. None can tell whether the executive's dream will die before it leaves, even leaves the crib. At Guangdong, burns ash, so do we. Not every focus needs to be taken if we believe the situation is under control. Ah. 
Japan is observing the crisis. So we have the GFT and the Council of the Committee of Chinese Labor. Kind of propaganda, they've been hard at work tying. Line of the sins of Guangdong about their desires, we need to put them in check. We need a lot of political power for this. Make it to a day, which is not bad. So, I forget. If we increase government despair, that makes it easier for us to pass stuff. It's only 15%. Anger's rising. Radicalism. We want low radicalism. Huh. Identify and detain GFT activists. Some of those prominent voices in supporting the unions you'd be reminded about what truly matters for Guangdong. Tasking our officers and finding and detailing them should cut them down in the overall unrest. Oh, increase, oh, we can increase radicalism to increase strength. Right? Find the police against the GFT. The police have requested for additional funds in order to combat the unionists. Who are we to say no? It means keeping the streets and businesses safe. There are rumors of the GFT moving around small arms and other equipment disguised as regular products. We need to double down security at all checkpoints between our cities. Target the police of the GFT. The GFT have become a nuisance too big to ignore. We'll direct our officers to focus the crackdowns and arrest on them for a while. Which you don't want to do because they don't want to increase Japanese frustration. Yeah. Use a camp by tie against them. Can't buy tie a certain methods and techniques that would surely help us in our fight against the unionists. They won't help. Their help won't come cheap, but we're running out of options. Divert resources away from the GFT. Uh, we're fighting too many fires right now. The current situation demands we reduce our efforts to keep the GFT in check. Nope. Address the Ludco. Given a speech, uh, Ludco floor about some of the measures we're taking to get the CCL and GFT under control. Should calm the chamber down for a while. No, that's not worth it. Reassure investors. Uh, last thing uh, going on can afford right now is the panic to cloud the judgment of the Japanese investors. We'll talk to several higher-ups and assure them that everything is being done to get the situation under control. Speak to the Japanese consulman. The Japanese mainland is understandably nervous about the current situation. Having a chat with the consul general will ensure that both of us and the Japanese are up to date on whether measures are being taken to combat the riots. Eh, we don't really need that. Negotiate. Negotiate. Right, these guys will do this too. Decrease strength, increase radicalism. You can do both. There you go. Because right now, then we get streets of rage. So we lost three things here, which is really stupid. Because uh, we had so we had so much support. It's not funny. Access denied. So we got to do LSF two. But in the Zujin police in this district to ensure that we don't lose control. There are also cool tensions while the officers fighting to maintain order come from the same background. And they've been maxed out support already. If anything, yeah, it's, they're both one hundred percent. Use tribe minimum in Mumai. The tribes are more than willing to help us calm down the riders, so long as we're also willing to look the other way as they try to profit off the situation. Low level negotiations in Mumai. Agreeing to several small concessions will have some of the workers in the district getting off the streets and putting down the picket signs. It's not bad, but I don't decrease growth. And the cost of political power, too. Product cycle? No. Mm. Well, I don't want any more corruption either. How much is corruption right now? None. That's not bad, actually. 2.5%. You know what? We could be working on that. Minus 0.64%. Because right now this is not good for us. Yeah. Because oh, everyone else, this is not great. But it's not bad overall. If we can get rid of the penalties, we'll be okay overall everywhere else. So that didn't help us out immediately, but keep doing that. We'll be we'll be okay in the end. So we just have a lot to do. Walk the talk. We've been saying we'll make life better for the regular Chinese Zuzhen people in Guangdong, but there are always pockets where our efforts do not reach. Mainly controlled at the behest of the other corporations which legally required or not, or not, to often took our policies as suggestions rather than really requirements. The indignities inflicted by the other corporations, or corporates, nothing new, but festering over time in the face of our promise has now exploded in a storm of rage, a spark lighting the tinder laid by the oil crisis. We promised the residents of Guangdong a semblance of justice and dignity, under Sony Chung Kong's leadership, and now the Guangdong access to walk the talk. Teach radicalism. We have promised change, the people ask where it is, and we must have an answer. Warm Summers. Those guys, Marita th thundered, as was carrying across the room, Hitachi has sent this whole country to the brink of ruin, and for what, Marita paced, eyes darting among his cabinet. Was it because Kamai thought we weren't harsh enough? Marita asked rhetorically. Do you think a few more cracked skulls and broken bones were what Guangdong needed to skim a few more yen off the bottom line? Marita turned to his cabinet. Kamai and his pack of selfish pests may wish to destroy us, but I would sooner drop dead before I give them an inch of satisfaction. Omori was the first to speak, idly glancing at the report in his hand. Sir, we cannot merely negotiate. People are well past the point where that can be reasoned with. 
I am well aware, Commissioner Amrita Snap. Do you take me for a fool? The sounds was his answer. As Gay swept across the room, anyone else? Both Nanjing and Tokyo. Already taking note, Master Shu's mild mannered voice quickly grasped Murita's attention. We all know China does not like her presence. It may be worth reviewing the Republic's role in her present situation. That's ridiculously cut him. What possible reaction could Nanjing have for such provocation amid our current crisis? Murita's deputy fixed Masashita with a glare. My countrymen are not idiots, Masashita, and for that matter, neither am I. Are you sure we're on the same side? Are you questioning my loyalty, Lee? I'm questioning your motives, Masashita, with your bottom line and your. Well, I am perfectly loyal, Masashita snapped back. Perhaps it should be you who. Enough, Murita thundered. We don't have time for bickering, and Guangdong is burning. And I will not be content to rule over a nation of ash. God, I wish I had a hairline like that. That looks really cool. Well, maybe not. Maybe when I get old. What is it? Radicals and fuels, uh. strength? Yeah, we're just at the beginning of this. Whoa, what happened here? Our deficit is radically better than what it used to be. Oh my god, the growth isn't great, but the deficit is... Oh my gosh. I'm okay with that deficit, for now. Hey, we're getting academic base continues improving. Haste. There had only been two hours notice from when the orders came from Koshu to prepare a raid on the Kowloon docks. Predictably, it had not been nearly enough. The first policeman to arrive. Well, well, a head of the Soviet units were, who needed two hours to prepare were regular patrolmen, easily visible in their white cars and blue uniforms. The warehouse exploded with the gunfires they approached, sending several officers crumpling into the pavement and driving the rest back to their vehicles, surrendering the city block to the defenders. As the police radio frequencies exploded, the reports of an ongoing fire by a van of armor riot police barreled to the scene, while the walls of ambulance sirens soon drowned out any other sound in the area. They stopped at the gate of the facility, with the remaining patrolmen grou grouping around the reinforcements. Is that all the dispatch sending? A Zujin officer rounded on the Japanese assault uh, commander. On the shock, if we could have secured the building, we won't have enough uh, to seal the exits. That was your job, imbeciles. The Japanese police lieutenant roared back, slapping the constable on the head. We're going in now, they're getting away, so get out of there and do your job. The van's engine roared as it charged towards the loading bay docks. A mighty crash was heard as the armed front of the van ripped through the aluminum surface, for the van was swallowed inside the warehouse. A few slid gunfire and shouting coming from inside. They came out 20 minutes later. A single broken, bloody man held limply between two armored men, with many more casualties behind him. Nobody knew how many had escaped. Hey, we got still, no matter what's happening, we have advancement in audio and video technology. Very good stuff here. Hey, more product interest? We're gonna need that. Hot tempers. The climate control of the chief executive's office was no match for the tempers of the oil crisis. The tension sat unacknowledged. In the boardroom, the tycoons, the chief executive on one end, and the Kumai on the other, like a prowling shark awaiting its prey. I apologize for nothing, Kumai spat, betraying uh, nothing as he stared down the table. For I cannot apologize for the incompetence of others sitting at this table. Who's incompetence, Kamai? Ibuka's face was a masterclass in, in, in expression. It doesn't matter, the government quite clearly has no control over the situation at hand. Kamai answered even, evenly, until the situation changes, I cannot, in conscious, allow Hitachi to continue adhering to the directives from this office. Outrageously thundered, the authority of the chief executive does not extend to the five companies, Kamai finished. Our def deference has merely been a matter of custom, not law. Law are not legally air, Guangdong is not your plaything, Kamai, and if you think this government will not will tolerate your flouting of... Tolerate, Kamai sneered. I see you are under the impression that you have a choice. The IJ clearly doesn't take any orders from the Chinese. The Tachi executive turned on his heels, storming out of the room. Mirita was silent, eyes fixated on the man's former seat. The worst thing about Kamai, when he's like this, he book aside, is that he isn't always wrong. He looked at the chief executive. He's untouchable. The garrison will rally around him, should have to. You must tread carefully. Duly noted. Health care is still getting better, as well as academic base, like I said. So, what are you doing? Listen to the street. The grievances of the people must be heard, or else their claim to represent them dies. Reduced riot strength and radicalism at the expense of Japanese frustration are locked. Discontent is no excuse. Whatever the grievances of the people are, disorder is not the way forward. Peacefully. Assist on permits. Wait until nightfall to beat them. Snap factory inspections. Um, can we afford that? Invite the leadership. Let them vent. Ooh. Reduces rider strength increase for a couple days. Normal's not enough. 1%, but we lose 2% at these places. We're going to lose the places anyways. Oh, man. Listen to the streets. How about we listen to them? The overwhelming ethnicities of our nation, the Chinese and Asian, have united and rallied against the great crimes done against them by Hitachi. We have sided with the people before and taken into their concerns as a solution previously. We must do so again when everything is on the table, even though a person I prefer dis discontent is no excuse. This is the easier route. We're going to take the harder route. Unity and strength. I still want to 
increase this if we can, but we can't right now. The strange feeling Lee Chun's heavy boots and worn down jacket felt strange without his tools. The belts of webbing and metal instruments that were vital on the job, but he supposed he wasn't on the job now. None of them were. Oh, look at all this stuff here. Yeah. Um, Brother Chun turned to Y, who gazed at him expectantly. You aren't going to work. It wasn't a question. There was only one place to go if you were head weren't headed to work. He nodded. Keep Hay safe, Y. It'll be okay. I'll be fine. Y nodded. Not quite believing his words, not quite ready to object. Chun felt his heart pain. She had grown to grow... She had to grow up so fast. Stay safe, safe, big brother. I will. Why, I will. The Koshu Sun beat upon them mercilessly. The, matter, the banner of the Guangdong Federation of Tradesmen carried high on the streets. The workers and laborers of the city marched defiantly behind. Tradesmen and craftsmen, steel workers and longshoremen, teamsters and shopkeepers, signs and placards waved defiantly. Slogans of profanity yelled in equal measure boomed through the megaphones carried by the crowd. Standing in the center of the teeming mass of humanity, Chun felt proud, proud of his adoptive home of his adopted city. Whether Zhujin or Chinese, factory workers or shopkeeper, even a few bureaucrats broke past the police cordon to join the march as it moved past the government quarters. Goshi would not forget the Itachi massacre. Chun could only hope the administrators and officials watching from their tinted windows would be on the black cloth police cordons wouldn't either. United in anger. In the belly of a terrible machine, speech had lost its value. Whistles, screeches, and blares from loudspeakers had completely replaced Japanese and Cantonese as the languages of Guangdong. With a sharp blow of a whistle that ordered a line of policemen uh, in front of a shield wall, hoisting their tear gas grenade launchers and firing the crowd before them, screams were only reply, dreadful and inarticulate, woeful hatred, the whistle blew again. Sergeant Chao Xiong had been waiting for the signal. With a cry, he charged forward, followed by closely a phalanx of policemen in full riot gear. None were men who minded getting their hands dirty, some, like the sergeant himself, greatly enjoyed this peculiar, uh, particular duty as Chao crashed into one protester, sending the skinny men tumbling to the ground. Uh, with a casual swing of his baton crunched into the man's face, scattering blood and teeth across the street. He turned on his heel and swung again, charitably opting to strike a female protester in the belly and avoiding any permanent damage. She fell like a puppet, whose string had been cut, and the sergeant felt a fresher thrill of pure power. That sounds like fun to me. Beyond a certain chow's men were either laying under the protesters or handcuffing those who'd been subdued. One by one, the protesters were dragged away into the waiting police vans, many already brimming with beaten men and women waiting to be taken to prison. While pain and sadness glittered in dozens of captured eyes, hatred remained in the mix, and no sense of defeat seemed present. After about 20 minutes of uh, more work, the protest march had been shattered. As leaders were scurrying away, the police had caught a fresh haul of troublemakers, and the cells of Guangdong would soon be overflowing. It's possible to imprison a man, but never the desire for freedom. Hey, look at that. Nice. That helps us actually quite a bit. Nice. Demographics, huh? Hey, 64 is not great, but it's not bad. 72, huh? Oh, that's... That's getting better. 77, 78, and one. Working on it. Access denied. Mm, five, yeah, that's fine to do. Daylight protest, nighttime terror. Lamb quietly observed the protest march from the past, his post. The desperate mass of marching past. The city marching past. He checked the time. Half past six. Still some, some time before nightfall. Nodding his replacement, some poor fresh-faced cadet, he headed back down, ducking to avoid the relentless midday sun. Lamb! He turned to the noise. Miss Yasukawa, he glanced at the police cordon. You shouldn't be here. I'm here for a story officer, Yoshiko replied evenly. Not now, Yoshiko. Lamb stated firmly. It's not safe out here. You need to stay in place. Yoshiko glanced at the protest march, the seemingly unending stream of Guangdong's underclass. Things seem perfectly fine out here. Yeah, but things change after dark. When the radicals come out, he glanced at the clock once more. Now, come on, we can't leave you out here. He checked the clock. Uh, as the clock, uh, as he grabbed his helmet and blessed goggles, glancing at the corkboard, could smell the scent of sweat and lubricant. His fellow officers lay sprawled against every, seemingly every uh, chair and flat surface, sleeping in restless fits, sustained off of coffee, stomach acid, or whatever new sustenance that mess was serving tonight. But the committee and the Federation would be out tonight, the meaner, leaner breed that had no hesitation when going to toe-to-toe -to -toe with the local police. As he reminded himself, these weren't the daylight protesters and organizers, the ones who elicited sympathy among even the most hardened officers. No, they all knew what was at stake. All of them could see the blinking lights of the IJA's garrison settled in an old British army barracks, heard the horror stories from Manchuria and Indonesia. Lamb heard the whistle blew and the call for reinforcements, his shift, and so into the night they went. Back to this one. How about the leadership? Let them vent. Decrease radicalism. Oh, we're going to decrease our seats even more. Jesus Christ. Uh, oh, this is bad too. Increase admin costs, increase growth. Good God. Of course, all the following. Jesus Christ, we chose a really bad one, didn't we? Oh, Jesus Christ. Um, as discontent spreads among the workers, it's important that we remind them that we have, they have always, we've always been, and will remain on their side. Using the mounting tension caused by the riots as their justification, snap inspections will be ordered for factories across Guangdong to ensure that the existing policies, which we so vigorously championed, are enforced. Pressure. 
Li tapped his foot impatiently as Commissioner Morris summarized his findings, scraped together in the hours following the botched raid in Hong Kong. Interrogation of the surviving suspects has yielded some actionable intelligence about various locations in Santo, Omori said briskly, uh, even as his expression darkened. But a window of opportunity will be extremely short. The escapes of several suspects during the Hong Kong Rail will no doubt force them to shift tactics. Be specific, Lee asked, a sharp edge to his voice, when you shifting tactics, you say. What do you mean? Changing safe houses is at a minimum, Omori replied, and now that they know that the police have a concrete lead, well, we have to factor in the worst case scenario. The office phone to a si tense silence, with Lee's voice growing more hairy with every one of Omori's evasive replies. Even if everyone present, Lee, Omori, Marita, and Stanley knew exactly what was being implied, they were hesitant to voice the possibility that their failed raid might have placed Lee's family into mortal danger, shortening the remaining lease least on life today's, if not ours. So the only thing we can do now is attack without adequate intelligence or sufficient resources. Lee balled his hands in a fist as he spoke, visibly willing himself to remain calm. Is there any way to even the odds by more time? Morita, Mori, and Stanley all looked at each other apprehensively before Mori shook his head heavily. The odds only get worse from here. Invite the leadership. Over the course of the riots, we have come into the wake of the oil crisis. Two major factions have emerged, which lead the rioters, the Guangdong Federation Tradesmen, and the Committee of Chinese Labor. The leadership of both organizations will be invited to meet the Chief Executive and Chief Secretary. We must hope that they are willing to be cooperate, cooperate with us, or else the situation will only continue to spiral downwards. But unfortunately, we must end it there, and we'll pick it up in the next episode. If you enjoyed the video, though, please consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we continue trying to, well, trying to defeat the last crisis we have at our hands. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.